I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Today we're telling a story of siblings born and bred to run the world. They were the most infamous family of the 20th century. Their story drips with conspiracy. Their names whispered through the decades since they left their voices echoing in time and space. Their hands helped mold the America we know, sharing with their country dreams of landing on the moon, freedom for every man. And by example, they inspired generations to reach the highest heights. They played with fire, and only a few survived. Their words ring through our history books, their pretty faces on our television screens, and their signature will forever be stamped on our national identity. They stood in the trenches. We stood beside them. They flashed their diamonds. We flashed our cameras. They had their fun, and we saluted them. They were good. They were evil. They were human. They are the Kennedy siblings. Let's take a trip to America's golden age to the home of the wealthiest family in the nation. They live so far above society that the children don't even know about the Great Depression, though they just lived through it themselves. Their childhood is being spent on yachts between movie stars and politicians, but despite all they have, one of those boys might be dead before he even reaches adulthood. And maybe that's where the infamous playboy persona of the future president began. But above all the glamour, above all of the adversity, family loyalty reigns superior. Or at least, that's what dad says. As Jack Kennedy grew up, he started to realize what it meant to be a Kennedy. And not just that he was the son of one of the most prominent and wealthy families in America. The Kennedys hadn't arrived. They were just getting started. Life magazine even went so far as to say that if Joe Kennedy ever became president, his appealing children would play a huge part in his election. People loved the family, the whole package. Here's a quote from Robert Dalek in his book, An Unfinished Life, about how the country viewed the Kennedys at this time. Quote, They were a symbol of hope to the country's millions of ethnics and its more established middle class who remained wedded to the belief, even in the worst of economic times, that anyone with exceptional talent and drive could still realize material opulence and public eminence exceeding the extraordinary promise of American life. In his book, Robert Dalek also mentioned that The Carnegies, the Roosevelts, the Rockefellers were symbols of the past. The Kennedys were symbols of the future. They embodied the hope of the next generation. So this is the backdrop that the Kennedy children grew up in. Joe Jr. and JFK, the eldest boys of the family, grew up with Grandpa Honey Fitz taking them to Red Sox games, boating in Boston Public Garden, or campaigning with him around the city in 1922. The Kennedy children went to local private schools in their early life, and they survived outbreaks of bronchitis, chickenpox, measles, mumps, scarlet fever, and whooping cough. If you know much about JFK, you probably know that he was a really sick kid, and his many illnesses haunted him for his entire life. From the time Jack was three, not a single year passed without illness or a medical issue. As a kid, because he missed so much school, he read a lot on his own and he developed a love for stories. Some of his favorites were Sinbad the Sailor, Peter Pan, King Arthur and the Round Table, Black Beauty, and a book called Billy Whiskers about a billy goat that traveled the world. (laughs) The Kennedys had a huge wraparound porch that the kids loved to play on, but Rose, their mom, had to use child safety gates to separate areas for each age group because she said, Allowing them all to play together was 
problematic. According to Rose, quote, There I was with seven children, and when they would play, they would knock each other down and gouge each other's eyes with toys. End quote. <laughs> In the Bouvier sisters story, you mentioned a lot how many nannies and maids and stuff that they had. I'm sure the Kennedys were oh, the same yes. way. Yes. They always grew up with multiple staff members. They had chefs, they had maids, they had nannies. And we'll get more into that too, because that is a huge symptom of her personality as well. Not only did they have the means to be able to do that, but that was also part of like who she was as a person. She was very organized and orderly. The Kennedy kids took morning walks with Rose to the local shopping area and the Catholic church, which their mom explained was not only for Sunday and special holidays, but part of a good Catholic daily life. Alcohol was not allowed in the Kennedy residence, but they always had an endless supply of fresh fruit, lavishly prepared family meals, and the favorite Kennedy dessert, Boston cream pie. I don't think I've ever had Boston cream pie, by the way. Neither have I. During Christmas, their house looked like a toy store from heaven. And speaking of Christmas, fun fact that I found, according to Rose, their mom, her dad, Honey Fitz, their grandpa, the smooth-talking politician who was also the mayor of Boston, was the first one to put a Christmas tree up in a city square. Rose claimed that he first had the idea to put a Christmas tree in the middle of Boston Common so that those who couldn't afford to buy their own would still have a Christmas tree, and that idea spread from there until thousands of cities and towns all over the country followed suit. So I feel like that's just absolutely too crazy. If you would have asked me, when was the tradition of putting a Christmas tree out in the in the middle of the like public square started? I would have thought like 16 or 1700s, England, Amsterdam, something like that. That, that paints like a really believable picture for me. But when I look it up, it says that having a Christmas tree in the middle of the city started in 1923 when President Calvin Coolidge first oversaw the lighting of the National Christmas Tree. And a decade later, in 1933, New York City lit the first Christmas tree at Rockefeller Plaza. So that timeline would absolutely add up for Honey Fitz to have started the, the tradition. tradition, yeah, in like the 1910s-ish. And this is why the Kennedys think that they rule the world. They kind of do. do. <laughs> of course, the family vacation every summer, beginning in 1926, was to the infamous Hyannis Port. All the kids learned how to swim there, and they were always doing something outside. Picnics on the beach, touch football, tennis. If you didn't already know, the Kennedys were competitive. During the summers growing up, when they would participate in sailing races on Nantucket, each Kennedy kid, outside of Rosemary, which we will talk about later, had their own sailing boat. So when Joe Kennedy started having the Kennedys, were they already insanely rich? No. So last episode, I think it was that... The first three were born, right? Right. And then he made his first million by the time he was 30 or 35. Oh, that's right. Yeah. He played the stock market to like... Yes fully make it and then that afforded them a lot more kids i think they only had either they were at rosemary so she was the third or maybe kathleen i think it was around the same time as when rose left and went to her dad's yes because okay. she was over it having sailboats you're rich right having each kid like literally eight sailboats eight plus the mom and dad because it says that Joe would follow in his boat and then he would like yell out critiques oh, for like each commands. of them. So like so, 10 yeah. sailboats. This shows you a little bit more of a sneak peek into Rose's personality. She would color coordinate their swim caps so she could tell which kid was which while they were in the ocean. <laughs> One of Jack's friends, Paul Chass, remembers, quote, Mr. K really did preach that winning was everything. And if one of Joe's kids was able to beat him in any activity, Monopoly, cards, sports, whatever, they would tease him endlessly with his favorite phrases. Quote, We don't want any losers around here. In this family, we want winners. Don't come in here second or third. That doesn't count. But win. They teased him, but they also believed him. They agreed. They needed to win. In the summer of 1935, 
The Kennedy kids came away from the Hyannisport Yacht Club Sailing Competition with 14 first place prizes, 13 second place prizes, and 13 third place prizes out of 76 starts. So they quote unquote medaled in 40 and did not in only 36. In 1960, Jack Kennedy's campaign biographer, James McGregor Burns, asked if anything really bothered him as a child. Jack only mentioned his competition with Joe. Joe, his big brother, was much bigger and more athletic than JFK, and he was also a bit of a bully. One of the girls that Jack dated as a teenager remembered that whenever they were alone, Jack would always talk about Joe. Joe plays football better. Joe dances better. Joe's getting better grades. Does this sound familiar? Just like Jackie effortlessly overshadowed and outshined Lee, Joe did the same to Jack, and Jack hated it just as much as Lee did. The Kennedys were boys, though, and so it was a much more aggressive physical tension between Jack and Joe than it was with Lee and Jackie. Their wrestling matches terrified their younger brother Bobby and their sisters, and one story that Jack remembered was a bicycle race that Joe suggested. They took off around the block in opposite directions, meeting head-on in front of their house. But they were both so stubborn, so unwilling to let the other win, that neither of them backed off and they collided, leaving Jack needing 28 stitches. Oh my gosh. Joe also treated Jack differently than all of his other siblings. He gently instructed and taught all of his younger siblings rules and techniques of games, except for Jack. He would keep those details secret from Jack. Oh, this gives me flashbacks to elementary school. I freaking hate it. He was really rough with him too. You know how mean kids can be. When they played football, instead of handing off the ball to Jack like you normally would, Joe Jr. would slam the ball into his chest as hard as he could. Regardless, Jack thought that his one and only big brother Joe hung the moon. Rose's parenting placed a responsibility on the oldest children to nurture and shape the younger kids, and Joe Jr. took on the role of pseudo-father like he was born for it. Jack later said, quote, I think if the Kennedy children amount to anything, now or ever amount to anything, it will be due more to Joe Jr.'s behavior and his constant example than to any other factor. Joe was strong, put together, and sure of himself. He was always the more serious one, and he had a pretty gnarly temper, though he rarely ever lost it with his youngest siblings. A lot of people around the family say that Joe Jr. treated little Teddy like a son instead of a brother. In most of the home videos of the Kennedys in Cape Cod, Joe is seen holding one of his younger siblings or carrying a kid on his shoulders. In 1926, when Jack was nine years old, 11-year-old Joe went to summer camp. Jack enjoyed being the oldest sibling for a moment, but their dad said that Jack was soon begging for his older brother to come back home and made his father promise that he could go to camp with Joe the following summer. Jack later remembered, quote, There was no one he would rather have spent an evening or played golf or, in fact, done anything with. Just like Jackie and Lee, they were rivals and best friends. The only one who could really hang physically with Jack and Joe was Kick, or Kathleen, as you may know her. At just two years old, she went out in the snow with the sleigh by herself. She always wanted to be doing what her older brothers were doing, and as a toddler, she was already showing the independent spirit that she would carry with her for the rest of her life. So from what I've read, Jack and Kick were the closest where Joe Jr. was the family cornerstone and he had that close relationship and competition with Jack, they were opposite personalities, and Jack and Kick were the class clowns. They shared sarcastic humor, messy personalities, and got through life by charming the socks off of anyone they met. I think that maybe Jack and Joe had this tension. They kind of pushed each other to be better, to do better. So they had like that type of closeness. But Jack and Kick had just more fun together. They were more vulnerable together. And it was a closeness that was different. So Jack and Kick were both quintessential middle children. They were the troublemakers. They were the independent rebellious spirits. And they invented the family motto together. Quote, 
Kennedys never cry. It was a slight against their father who used to tell them there was no crying allowed in the house. They both got into trouble at school constantly, and when Jack eventually got his license, they'd be the two silently rolling the car into the driveway with the headlights out well after curfew. Whatever Jack and Kick had between them, it was special. A school friend remembered, quote, Kathleen was bonded to Jack with a profundity that mere blood seemed insufficient to describe. Mm. In 1927, when she was just seven years old, Kick prepared for her first Holy Communion by herself. She went to church at seven years old every day of the week leading up to the ceremony without her parents knowing while they were away in California. And she's in Boston. It was up to Joe Jr. to be her pseudo-parent and write to his mom and dad to let them know that Kathleen was preparing herself for the sacrament. That same year, in 1927, Joe Jr. was 12, Jack was 10, Rosemary was 9, and on down, the family moved from Boston to Riverdale, New York. It was a rural Bronx suburb of Manhattan. Joe, their dad, had become successful in the film industry, and since he was constantly traveling between New York and L.A., the family thought it would be a better location. It also had a little bit to do with Boston's social barriers. We talked a little bit about that environment last episode, so if you missed it, go listen to that. Joe later told a reporter, quote, Boston was no place to bring up Irish Catholic children. I didn't want them to go through what I had to go through when I was growing up there. He and Rose still loved Massachusetts, though, so Joe bought that Hyannisport estate that they had been renting, and from then on, it was solidified as the official summer home of the Kennedy family. Rose remembered this move to New York as a blow to the stomach. For months and months, she would wake up in their 13-room house overlooking the Hudson River and, quote, feel a terrible sense of loss. She missed her familiar surroundings and her friends and family, and so because of her unhappiness, two years later, they made a second move, but not back to Boston. In 1929, they moved into a mansion on six acres in the village community of Bronxville, New York. It was a few miles north of the house on the Hudson and a little less city. The average per capita income was the highest in the country, which was much more to Rose's liking. This is an interesting anecdote about the brotherly dynamic between Jack and Joe Jr. Jack had easily settled into their new private school in New York and was making excellent grades in the fourth and the fifth grade. But in the sixth grade, when Joe Jr. went off to boarding school, Jack's grades immediately started slipping. That just shows you, like, concrete proof of how emotionally bonded these siblings were. Calling back to... um the Disney episode when I talk about how Cassie left for college and I was depressed. Oh, yeah. Rose mentioned in her memoirs that she and Joe had decided that he would be in charge of the decisions for the boys and she for the girls. So the girls went to Catholic Sacred Heart co- Convent School. What? This is so weird. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, to separate weird. your kid based on gender. They were going to have an army and they were like, okay, delegating duties now. Yeah, they're just so, like sterile about it. So Rose being in charge of the girls' school, the girls all went to Catholic Sacred Heart Convent School, just like their mother had attended. Joe had decided to send Jack to boarding school as well, but instead of going to the same one as his big brother attended, Jack went to an exclusive Catholic academy in Connecticut. His main interests at this new school were current events and sports. A little peek into who he's going to be as president. One morning at Mass, a missionary got up and spoke about India. Jack described it as, quote, one of the most interesting talks that I ever heard. Theodore C. Sorensen, an associate of JFK's, said that Jack, quote, had a desire to enjoy the world and a desire to improve it. And these two desires, particularly in the years preceding 1953, had sometimes been in conflict. The Kennedys seem to always have this understanding of the responsibility of privilege, and they all had the desire to help others and improve the world as much as they could. They also had almost unlimited access to all of the luxuries you can imagine, and it seems that sometimes the temptation to just enjoy what they had won out. In 1960, Time journalist Hugh Sidey asked, 
What do you remember about the Great Depression? Jack replied, quote, I have no firsthand knowledge of the Depression. My family had one of the great fortunes of the world, and it was worth more than ever then. We had bigger houses, more servants, we traveled more. About the only thing that I saw directly was when my father hired some extra gardeners just to give them a job so they could eat. I really did not learn about the Depression until I learned about it at Harvard. That shocks me for a couple of reasons. Living through the pandemic, I can't imagine anyone younger than eight years old not knowing what's happening as it's happening. And because he wasn't five when it happened, you would think that he would be hearing adults around him talk about it, hear it on the radio. A bit of clarification on that. Jack was born in 1917, so he would have been like a preteen teenager as the depression is happening. Because the Kennedys treated their kids like many adults. Right. You would think that That's they would so be discussing conflicting. these types of things. And because the Kennedys are obviously into politics and their grandpa was mayor of Boston and they were in that scene, it's not like they were super ignorant of current events and policy the public state. and economy and stuff like that. Since we're talking about all of the really weird ways that the Kennedys grew up, listen to this. Charles Spaulding, one of Jack's closest childhood friends, said this, quote, You watch these people go through their lives and just had a feeling that they existed outside of the usual laws of nature. But there was no other group so handsome, so engaged. There was endless action, endless talk, endless competition, people drawing each other out and pushing each other to greater lengths. It was as simple as this. The Kennedys had a feeling of being heightened and it rubbed off on the people who came in contact with them. They were a unit. I remember thinking to myself that there couldn't be another group quite like this one. The Kennedys were different, and they knew it. You might even say they were a bit pretentious. <laughs> Joe Sr., their dad, could be short and unfriendly and saw most people as unworthy of his time. Another way their arrogance manifested was how casual they were about paying people. They would constantly borrow money from friends and ask other people to pick up their bill, which you would think would be really weird for rich people. But it wasn't because they expected their friends to pay for them, but it was because their dad's money men would square accounts later. They just couldn't be bothered. They usually did pay people back, but occasionally their friends or shop owners they borrowed from would awkwardly have to ask for payment later after the Kennedy children had forgotten. Once when a gas station owner refused to accept promised to pay later for a fill-up, a car full of raggedly dressed kids, some barefoot, told him, We're Kennedys. I love that mental picture because it's just so weird. It's like an oxymoron. It doesn't make yes, sense. Yes, it's so it's like they're, bizarre. They're, they're all little pippy long stockings, but their plot twist, they're freaking rich. They look like homeless orphans. Yeah. And they live in like a mansion. A mansion and their parents are like, some of the most important people in the country. In the richest part of the country. The owner opted for a call to the Kennedy compound instead, and in minutes, a chauffeur showed up with some gasoline to get the car back home. That is hilarious, because why did he show up with gasoline? They're at a freaking gas station. Why yes. did they not show up with money? They were like, well, screw you. I get <laughs> That's actually a really gas. good point, because you have endless funds. Why would you haul gas? It also gives you a bit of insight of that like ridiculous confidence that they just were running through the town barefoot and dirty and they're like, we don't freaking care what people think of us because we know who we are and it doesn't matter. Yes, it, they, they were not scared to be questioned because it didn't matter. Mm -mm. Like, we know who we are. We all have each other's backs. Come at us. Jack once said, quote, I never carried cash. After all, why would someone so well off need money to pay for anything? Everyone knew, or should have known, that they were good for their debts. The self-centeredness was a bit extreme. People say that they would step off of one of the Kennedy boats onto the Hyannisport Pier, and the kids would just start ripping their clothes off and throwing them on the ground as they ran, knowing that someone else would pick up after them. It's so ridiculous and bizarre, too, that they all ended up being insanely hard workers. Servants. Public yes. servants. Yes, yes. Just doing the absolute most for their country and being under insane stress. Right. But I think that a lot of people who grew up like this have a lack of parental guidance. And the Kennedys had far from a lack of. Yeah, but still, it could be the whole 
this is what kids do. Kids have fun and they they yes. live their life and our only job is to get an education and to be good be a good sibling, be a good son, be a good daughter, whatever. And become a good person. And become a good person. And then once you become an adult, that then is you when, have a responsibility. Yes. And that stark line. I am doing my job right now. Right. And I'm going to do my job when I'm an adult as well. Mm-hmm. We talk about this more in the Kennedy family meetings. So if you haven't been listening to those episodes and you're interested in this kind of topic, definitely go back and catch up. Jack had a reputation for being especially messy. The Kennedy maids complained about, quote, wet towels in a heap on the floor, the tangle of ties in one corner, the bureau drawers turned over and emptied in the middle of the bed in a hurried search for some wanted item. And this is kind of crazy too. One of Jack's childhood friends remembered that they quote, really didn't have a real home with their own rooms where they had pictures on the wall or memorabilia on the shelves, but would rather come home for holidays from their boarding schools and find whatever room was available. Which room do I have this time? Jack would ask his mother. He did not feel he had to live by the ordinary rules governing everyone else. He was always arriving late for meals and classes, setting his own pace, taking the least traveled path. He was his father's son. And this was definitely a mentality that the Kennedys carried because one of Jack's friends recalled that, quote, With the Kennedys, life speeded up. (laughs) And no, I did not (laughs) say it like that. That was the quote, word for word. It was the Kennedy mantra. Be strong, fight harder, don't give in. And that was what Kick told herself over and over at Catholic boarding school when she just wanted to be home with her family. And that's another thing where you were like, your job right now is to be a kid. Da, 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 da. Their jobs were to go to school and be diligent and study. And we can ha- we have fun when we have fun and we work hard when we work hard. In 1933, after returning to school post-Christmas vacation, Kick wrote this letter to her mother. Quote, I miss you all like anything. In fact, worse than I ever have. Every day this week, I'd sit in the state study hall and think, a week ago today, I was basking in the sun, and now I am in a fire trap trying to study. It's a great life if you don't weaken. (laughs) Jack knew how much Kick hated all the rules, and he really empathized. Remember, they had very similar personalities, and so he would frequently visit her and bring his friends from Choate with him to hang out with Kick and her friends at her boarding school pause there because I think that's huge for a older brother to bring his guy friends to an all girl I mean it's an all girl school so hey but also that's a lot of effort to like like, spend your free time with your sister that's the thing okay it is an all girl school and I'm sure that he found some dates there but also you're like spending your time with your little sister like not a lot of big brothers want to do that in high school especially if you have like all the freedom and all the money and all the cars and drivers in the world that that's what you choose to do I think that goes back to the whole like what are you responsible for as a kid in their mind they did take the responsibility of being an older brother or being an older sibling or being Mm -hmm. a sibling in general because you'll see in the next few episodes with Rosemary that they took that responsibility very seriously yeah and so you can start to see the work ethic, the responsibility, and the like care for other people yep. start at an early age because they freaking took their sibling relationships super seriously. seriously yeah. And one of Jack's most loyal friend who visited Kick with Jack the most and also was around so much that he was basically a family member was Lemoyne Billings, or Lem as everyone called him. He and Jack originally bonded over their mutual hatred of the strictness at school, like Kick, but after a while, the Kennedy family basically adopted him. Lim's father died while he was attending school with Jack and left him no money, so the Kennedys stepped up. Joe Kennedy Sr. used to call him, quote, My second son. He was like a brother to all of the Kennedy siblings, and so we will have quotes from him all throughout all of our episodes. I mean, he talks on Rosemary. He was there for the presidency. He and Jack were best friends, best friends from their school days all the way up until Jack's death. And he even like stayed in the White House. He knew Jackie. So we're going to be hearing from him a lot. He is a main character. Okay. It's also really great to hear from him because a lot of the evidence we get from his point of view was 
letters written from him or to him and the Kennedy family. So we get a firsthand look from their written word of what was going on at the time. So anytime I mention Lem or Billings or Lemoyne Billings, that's who we're talking about. <laughs> okay, well, my nose is absolutely dripping off my face. So. What happened to you? You, like, got into something. Someone was mowing their lawn on my way here this morning. And, and I need another tissue. Okay. <laughs> We've got to, like, do something. There's no way we're going to get through this. No one will be the wiser if we record the rest later or tomorrow. And for sure, and just put our same outfits on again. And the Patreon, we can just be like, "Hey, you got the inside scoop." Oh yeah, that's a good we idea. Film this on two different days. That's a good idea. These allergies. We're eating her live, and we were sweating. <laughs> is that still recording, dude? It is balls hot in here. Yeah. <laughs> you look at the thermostat. It's like we're at Bob and Grandma's. Another Kennedy superpower was that they had unparalleled unity, and they learned this from their parents. Once, Joe Sr. called Jack away from a game of tennis to meet a man named Lawrence Fisher. He was one of the brothers who had gotten wealthy and very, very famous from designing cars for General Motors. Quote, Jack, I sent for you because I want you to meet Mr. Lawrence Fisher, one of the most famous Fisher body family. I wanted you to see what success brothers have who stick together. So wait, who is this brother? His name was Lawrence Fisher, and apparently some of the really prominent designers for General Motors were brothers. And so Joe just wanted to use him as an example to Jack of like, hey, look, if you have loyal family members around you, brothers specifically, look how far you guys can go together. And that's essentially what Cassie and I are here to do as well. And this... Siblings who stick together are successful. Lesson was one that none of the Kennedy children ever forgot. Once, when Joe Jr. and Jack were arguing, one of Jack's friends tried to take his side. Jack turned to him immediately and said, Mind your own business. Keep out of it. I'm talking to Joe. After a year at the Catholic school, Jack did not want to go back and instead asked his parents if he could follow Joe Jr. to Choate. And off he went. Their parents were less interested in where the boys got their education and more focused on the chance to network them. They wanted them to go to these high caliber schools, not to get the best education, but so that they would meet the sons of America's most influential families. Joe and Rose had their sights ultimately set on Harvard for the boys, but to get into Harvard, you had to have attended one of these schools. Jack did well on his entrance exams, but even if he hadn't, he would have been allowed in. The desire to have Jack Kennedy at Choate was not one-sided. He failed the Latin part of his entrance exam in the spring of 1931, but the school was more than happy to let him retake the test after some summer tutoring. Even if he didn't pass the second one, which he did, the school was intending to enroll him in the fall term regardless. (laughs) Jack did have challenges in his school years, though. I mentioned that he had consistent poor health throughout his life, so let's talk a little bit more about that because I had no idea the extent of it. For most of his adolescence, doctors didn't know what was wrong with him. When he was 13, in the fall of 1930, he started dropping weight pretty rapidly with no explanation. He was tired all the time, and he wasn't growing like a boy his age should. One doctor diagnosed it as a lack of milk in his diet, but even after he started drinking more milk, he almost passed out in a chapel service. The next year, he collapsed from stomach pains. He went to the hospital for two nights because of a mild cold. By 1933, he developed flu-like symptoms and constant pain in his knees. Quote, Jack's winter term sounded like a hospital report according to a 50th anniversary remembrance of his attendance at the school, because apparently they do that at high caliber schools. By the time Jack turned 16, he had gained no weight. For him, this meant that he couldn't play football, but it really concerned his doctors about his health. 
Nobody could figure out what in the world was wrong with him. Jack wrote to Lim after he got out of the hospital, quote, It seems that I was much sicker than I thought I was and am supposed to be dead. So I am developing a limp and a hollow cough. He also complained that his rectum was, quote, Plenty red after the hospital. Yours would be red, too, if you shoved everything from rubber tubes to iron pipes up it. When I crap, I don't even feel it because it's so big. His symptoms started to diminish in the end of 1933, but by June of 1934, he started feeling really sick again. He was a junior at Choate, and Joe sent him to the famous Mayo Brothers Clinic in Minnesota for treatment. Wait, the Mayo Brothers Clinic as in the Mayo Clinic? As in the Mayo Clinic was started by two brothers? I had never noticed how many freaking siblings go into business together until we started this podcast and then like left and right. I'm like, oh, we could do episodes about them. Jack was shipped off to the Mayo Brothers Clinic by himself and had endless amounts of tests done to see if they could figure out why he was so sick. It was exploratory examinations every single day. Lem Billings later told an interviewer, quote, We used to joke about the fact that if I ever wrote a biography, I would call it John F. Kennedy, A Medical History. Yet I seldom ever heard him complain. And here's an excerpt from a letter that Jack sent home from his time at the Mayo Clinic. Quote, I am suffering terribly out here. I now have a gut ache all the time. I'm still eating peas and corn for my food, and I had an enema. My bowels have utterly ceased to be of service, and the only way I'm able to unload is for them to blow me out from the top down or the bottom up. Jeez. Two days later, he wrote, quote, God, what a beating I'm taking. I've lost eight pounds and still going down. I'm showing them a thing or two. Nobody is able to figure out what's wrong with me. All they do is talk about, what an interesting case. It would be funny if there was nothing wrong with me. Still, I don't know when I will get home. My last eight meals have been peas, corn, and prunes. Six days after that, he wrote, I got something wrong with my intestines. In other words, I crap blood. And by now, he was afraid that he may actually be dying. Here's some more of Jack's letters from that time. Quote, I'm just a shell of the former man, and my penis looks as if it's been through a ringer. I've had 18 enemas in three days. I'm clean as a whistle. They give me enemas until it comes out like drinking water, which they all take a sip of. Oh, obviously he was a little annoyed. Quote, Yesterday I went through the most harassing experience of my life. First, they gave me five enemas until I was white as snow inside. Then they put me in a thing like a barber's chair. Instead of sitting on the chair, I kneeled with my head where the seat is, and then a blonde took my pants down. Then they took and tipped the chair over, and surrounded by nurses, the doctor stuck his finger up my butt. I blushed because you know how it is. (laughs) He then withdrew his finger, and then... The schmuck took an iron tube 12 inches long and one inch in diameter up my butt. I'm cringing. Ugh. It sounds so painful. And he's freaking by himself. Like, where are his parents? He's by himself. Ugh. And Cassie's going to defend the parents and be like, well, wait. You don't know what they're doing right now. You've got to wait for the Rosemary episodes. Yeah, you guys have to wait, but... They also had eight other children. They needed to go visit him or something. Send Send a brother. Send Joe Jr. Send somebody because that is horrific. He also said, quote, They had a flashlight inside it and they looked around and they blew a lot of air in me to pump up my bowels. I was certainly feeling great, as you know you would, having a lot of strangers looking up your butthole. Not... (laughs) The reason I'm here is that they may have to cut out my stomach. The latest news. This is good to remember for context for Jack. There were other stuff going on at home. But this is also good to remember for next episode that during all the things going on at home, there was also this going on. Jack's medical issues were just endless. They finally diagnosed him with colitis and then thought that maybe he had ulcers. 
Jack wrote to Lem, quote, It was the most harrowing experience of all my storm-tossed career. They came in this morning with a gigantic rubber tube. Old stuff, I said, and rolled over thinking naturally that it would be stuck up my butt. Instead, they grabbed me and shoved it up my nose and down into my stomach. Then, they poured alcohol down the tube. They were doing this to test my acidosis. They had the thing up my nose for two hours. The doctors were concerned about his blood counts, and according to Jack, it was at 6,000 when he entered the hospital, and then three weeks later, it was down to 3,500, and at 1,500, you die. By the end of January 1935, he really started to panic that he might be dying and that no one would ever figure out how to help him. This caused a bit of mania and sent him into the state where he was kind of just trying to pack as much pleasure into his life as he could with the time available. He started showing behavior quite like his father and began sleeping around a whole heck of a lot. Quote from Jack. Beatty came to see me today in the hospital, and I laid her in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> he had little respect for the women that he was using for his sexual pleasure, but ironically, he really cared for his sisters, and he always considered their feelings and their emotions, so he definitely viewed the women in his family differently than everybody else, especially Rosemary and Kick. He was very sensitive with Rosemary, and in his biographies, it says that he was the sibling outside of Eunice that really went out of his way to make sure she was cared for and treated her as well as any of the other siblings. Eunice was a special champion of Rosemary's too, though, and we will hear lots about her next episode, but they were all caring towards her. Here's a quote from Rose about Jack's parents' anxieties surrounding his health. Quote, but what concerned us as much or more was his lack of diligence in his studies, or, let us say, lack of fight in trying to do well in those subjects that didn't happen to interest him. He is fighting for his life. <laughs> Choate had a highly structured set of rules, traditions, and expectations into which a boy was supposed to fit. And if he didn't, there was little or no permissiveness. Joe Jr. had no trouble at all operating within this system. It suited his temperament. <clears throat> like Jackie? But Jack couldn't or wouldn't conform. Like Lee. He did pretty much what he wanted rather than what the school wanted of him. End quote. So on top of the medical issues that Jack had, he also felt like he was constantly in Joe Jr.'s shadow. By the time that Jack had started going to school at Choate, Joe had already established himself as, quote, one of the big boys of the school on whom we are going to depend. Joe's success in sports and in academics really threatened Jack's identity. Like Lee compared to Jackie, Jack compared to Joe was struggling socially and in his classes. He was tall, skinny, always sick, and his classmates called him a rat face because of his narrow face and his buck teeth. Jack wanted so badly to be great at sports, but he just didn't have the physical abilities. And when Joe won the school's Harvard trophy at his graduation in 1933, it confirmed to Jack that he could never win his parents' approval to the degree that his brother had. Jack wrote to Lem that he believed he was as intelligent as his brother and probably even as good as an athlete, but he had little confidence that his family would ever believe that he matched up to Joe Jr. Okay, well, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> even if you've just ever seen a photo of the two of them, yeah, Joe Jr. is like very muscly, just like built bigger, and Jack is a lot lankier. And if you are a person that's Googling every five seconds to like see who these people are, especially with this story, because there are, like we said, nine of them and it's hard to keep track of who's who, definitely go check out our Patreon because I have done a ton of digging and have found all of the best photos that go along with the timeline that we are talking about. Jack may have been a little off base there, but the Kennedy standards were insane. They were expected to be the best of the best in absolutely everything. 
sports, academics, socially, there was an insistence that each of the Kennedy children reach the top of the ladder, especially the boys. The Kennedy kids, more than anyone, knew that privilege had its advantages, but heavy is the head that wears the crown. A Kennedy family biographer said, Joe stressed to his children the importance of winning at any cost and the high of coming in first. All of Joe's heroes were not poets or artists, but entrepreneurs, politicians, leaders, and he just assumed that, of course, his kids wanted public success just like him. A bit too often, his perception of their desires for their life were actually just his dreams projected onto his offspring. And to make matters worse for Jack, Joe Jr. had a personality much like his father, and because he was so on board for the life that his father had planned for him, he was naturally the favorite. He was also the oldest, and he carried his father's namesake, which we talked about in the movie episodes with Jackie. There are just so many references and comparisons, but she was the oldest and named after her dad, and there was a strong element of pride there that you really just couldn't compete with. Joe Sr., their dad, definitely poured a ton of care into his relationship with Jack, and Jack knew how much his dad wanted him to succeed and did love him, but he also knew that his dad resented all of his medical issues. Quote, Jack was sick all the time, and the old man could be an a-hole around his kids. One of Jack's friends remembered. Once, in the late 1940s, while vacationing in Palm Beach, Florida, Joe snidely asked Jack's girlfriend, Quote, why don't you get a live one? Jack always defended his father, though. So when a friend started to say something like, hey, your dad's kind of hard on you, Jack said to him, quote, everybody wants to knock his block off, but he made the whole thing possible. It just keeps coming up that they really were super aware of their privilege and that even amongst all of the privileged kids and the privileged families, they were still different. There was something different about them. Jack Kennedy did consider whether all the pressure and intensity of being a Kennedy was worth the privilege. Quote, We all have our fathers, Jack said to a friend. All of the Kennedy children loved their dad immensely, but they were also scared to death of him. In November of 1933, Joe Sr. wrote to George St. John, the headmaster at Jack's school. Quote, I can't tell you how unhappy I was in seeing and talking with Jack. He seems to lack entirely a sense of responsibility. His happy-go-lucky manner with a degree of indifference does not portend well for his future development. We have possibly contributed as much as anybody in spoiling him by having secretaries and maids following him to see that he does what he should do. Joe would also encourage Joe Jr. to push Jack and help him in any way that he could with his schoolwork. He would regularly write to Joe at school, asking him to check in on Jack and encourage him to do better. Like we discussed, Jack Kennedy's academic career was average as far as his grades and popularity. He wasn't the star football player like Joe, but he also won most likely to succeed his senior year. So it was kind of like all of the adults disapproved of him on paper, but his classmates really respected him and they saw something special. Jack's housemaster at school wrote, quote, I'd like to take the responsibility for Jack's constant lack of neatness about his room and person since he lived with me for two years. In the matter of neatness, I must confess to failure. Jack studies at the last minute, keeps appointments late, he has little sense of material value, and can seldom locate his possessions. (laughs) George St. John did see something in Jack, though. Choate's headmaster remembered, quote, He was the best informed boy of his year, although he conspicuously failed to open his school books. People said that he was super interested in world affairs. He was academic and self-motivated, just not in the traditional way. He was always listening to the radio, reading the New York Times, and had a lifelong fascination with Winston Churchill's writings. St. John, Jack's headmaster, also wrote, quote, The longer I live and work with him, and the more I talk with him, the more confidence I have in him. I would be willing to bet anything that within two years, you will be as proud of Jack as you are now of Joe. 
Jack is one of the best people that ever lived. One of the most able and interesting. I could go on about Jack. Though he always defended his dad, the comments about his health got to him because it was already a major insecurity for Jack. A friend said, quote, Jack's frame as a light, thin person, his proneness to injury of all kinds, his back, his sickness, which he wouldn't ever talk about, he was heartily ashamed of them. They were a mark of effeminacy, a weakness, which he wouldn't acknowledge. Once, a friend was giving him a hard time for being too concerned about improving his appearance by wanting to go out and get a tan. Jack replied, quote, Well, it's not only that I want to look that way, but it makes me feel that way. It gives me confidence. It makes me feel healthy. It makes me feel strong, healthy, attractive. Their dad wasn't unaware of how judgmental and harsh he could be, nor how discouraging it could be for his kids. Everyone around them said that Joe encouraged his kids to argue back with him and have an independence and even irreverence at times towards him. He would push them to argue their own point of view, make up their own minds. Lem Billings recalled that, quote, Dinner conversations at the Kennedys never consisted of small talk. Joe Sr. never lectured. He would encourage the children completely to disagree with him, and of course, they did disagree with him. Mr. Kennedy is, I'd say, far right of his children, and yet he certainly didn't try to influence them in that way. Historians say that Joe Jr. was who Joe Sr. believed he could be, but that Jack was who he was. Jack Kennedy wrote on a graduation photo to one of his classmates, quote, To Boss Tweed from Honest Abe, may we room together at Sing Sing. <laughs> Which is so freaking eerie if you know all the freaking connections about Jack Kennedy and, and uh, Abraham Lincoln's and presidency Abe. and Honest Abe. <laughs> oh, it's really weird. So, Kick, Kathleen, the one who was most like Jack and the fourth Kennedy sibling, adored her dad. He took his role as a father very seriously, and he loved children, but only his own. Every Sunday, while Joe was away, the children would line up in order of age and take their turns talking to him on the phone. He wanted his kids to be, quote-unquote, perfect Americans, though, and because of that, he was harsh. Let's just pause for that mental picture of all of them, literally all nine of them lining up from tallest oh to youngest. So because of how much he cared and how much he wanted his kids to be successful and contributing citizens, Kick became his favorite daughter, and he really struggled to navigate his relationship with Rosemary. He'd say, Tell me the truth. Tell me everything about it, the whole truth. Then I'll do everything I can to help. But if you don't give me the truth, I'm licked. He believed in treating the kids as little adults, but communicating with Rosemary this way wasn't really possible. We will talk lots more about Rosemary and her relationship with her father, but if you've never heard of her, it's likely for the same reasons that she is known as the Hidden Kennedy. Her story is complicated, and we will get into all of her relationships with each member of her family, but just know that she was emotionally connected with her father, but she had intellectual disabilities, and this was something that Joe Sr. was really never able to fully accept. Teddy, the youngest of all nine kids, said this was Joe when he was at his best. The greater the disaster, the brighter he was. <laughs> when things went really bad, Joe would exclaim, That may be one of the best things that ever happened to you. He wanted his children to thrive. And this was what was so frustrating for him about Rosemary's condition. He was used to conquering every challenge that came his family's way, but he was never able to fully beat or conquer her disabilities. It was threatening to his identity, the fact that he couldn't fix it. He lived challenge to challenge, taking on each of his kids' challenges as his own, and he was never able to eliminate Rosemary's challenges. When Joe Jr. graduated from high school at Choate, his father sent him to England for a year to study with a prominent socialist academic. Rose was a little worried about it and considered it, quote, a little wild and even dangerous. But you'll see a trend here. Joe had a habit of completely ignoring Rose's opinion. And so he sent Joe anyway, 
believing it would instill greater independence and strengthen Joe Jr.'s ability to support a more conservative outlook. When Joe Jr. got back from his trip to Europe and described the advantages of socialism over capitalism, Joe told Rose, quote, If I were their age, I would probably believe what they believe, but I am of a different background and must voice my beliefs. He really cared more about his kids' ability to reach an independent thought than he cared about them having the same opinion as him. This time, though... Joe may have realized Rose was right, because when Joe Jr. wrote him sharing some very Nazi beliefs, he was quick to discourage his thinking, as he rarely did. But you will hear more on that, Joe Jr. and Hitler, in the upcoming episodes. Okay, enough about Joe for now. Like we said earlier, their mother was not a perfect parent either. Both of their parents cared a lot, but... They each had their issues. Here is a comment about Rose. Quote, She organized and supervised the large family with the institutional efficiency that she had learned from the Ursuline nuns of Sacred Heart Academy. She insisted on strict adherence to domestic routines and an idealistic dedication to the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. She admitted that she had all of the domestic help that she could want, so she ran the household more like an executive than a mother. Lem Billings remembered her as, quote, tough, constant, a minute disciplinarian with a fetish for neatness and order and decorum. She was incredibly private and discouraged any show of emotion or physical touch. Jack said as an adult, quote, she was terribly religious. She was a little removed. He also complained in private that she never told him that she loved him. Another friend, Charles Spaulding, who saw the family up close, described Rose as, quote, So cold, so distant from the whole thing. I doubt if she ever rumpled the kid's hair in his whole life. It just didn't exist, the business of letting your son know you're close, that she's there. She wasn't. And Jackie, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, told a journalist while talking about Jack once, quote, History made him what he was. This lonely, sick boy. His mother really didn't love him. She likes to go around talking about being the daughter of the mayor of Boston or how she was an ambassador's wife. She didn't love him. History made him what he was. In response to her emotional absence, Jack would try to be mildly rebellious just to annoy her. Once, on Good Friday, when their mom asked them to pray for a happy death, Jack said he wanted to wish for two dogs instead. (laughs) He would also make a point to interrupt Rose's Bible stories with questions about what happened to the donkey Jesus rode into Jerusalem? Who took care of the donkey after Jesus was gone? And he also made sure to keep a messy room, dress as sloppily as possible, show up to dinner late. The boy was mad. Something quite disturbing that I read is that when Kick was just seven years old, she wrote to her mother that she, quote, gained a pound and a half. Eunice gained some too. Rose is as fat as ever. Apparently their mother was obsessed with their weight, even the boys, but especially the girls. Every Saturday, they were weighed. Rose also dressed them all alike, as if their only identity was Kennedy. Rose used to write what they called, quote-unquote, round-robin notes to all of her children. I think that they just kind of read it and then passed it to the next kid, and that kid read it, and they passed it to the next kid, so that she didn't have to write all of her nine children individually and say the same thing. Basically, it was the family group text. So Jack replied to one of these round robin notes once by writing a letter back to his mom saying, quote, I enjoy your round robin letters. I'm saving them to publish. That style of yours will net us millions. With all this talk of inflation and where is our money going? When I think of your potential earning power, it's enough to make a man get down on his knees and thank God for the Dorchester High Latin School, which gave you that very sound grammatical basis, which shines through every slightly mixed metaphor and each somewhat split infinitive. 
this side of Jack kind of reminds me of when Jackie's auction class stepbrother, Jamie, was standing at the top of the stairs in his red velvet shorts when he first met Jack. And he said, hello, Kennedy. And Jack just immediately replied in the same tone. Hello, auction class. Jack Kennedy could hang. It's hard to say exactly where their mom was coming from. She said herself that she knew she could be really strict and harsh, and so she tried very consciously to balance that with an environment of fun and laughter. Mm. She would joke around with her kids and allow them to roughhouse and make fun of each other and talk about whatever they wanted to at any time. Things that happened at school, opinions, interests, friends. She was said to have seen her job as a mother as a high spiritual calling. She said, quote, I looked on child rearing not only as a work of love and duty, but as a profession that was fully as interesting and challenging as any honorable profession in the world, and one that demanded the best I could bring to it. And maybe that professionalism and bold organization and systematic approach that she had made her kids feel a little less like loved children and more like coworkers. But it wasn't because she didn't care. She was putting a massive amount of effort into doing what she thought she needed to do to make sure that they would grow up to be the best people they could be and have the best life that they could have. She grew up under the quote unquote spare the rod and spoil the child era. Rose had a bulletin board near the dining room and every evening before dinner, she would pin up a news article or a magazine clipping about a topic so that her kids could discuss and debate the quote-unquote issue of the day with their parents. History, geography, and religion were her main priorities. One of Kick's childhood friends remembered that being at the Kennedy dinner table was like being in a classroom. Rose was also known to keep file folders on each of her children's illnesses. She probably had to with as many children as she had and as many medical issues that came up for them too. We know how many hospital stays and different illnesses that Jack had. But we also need to talk about Rosemary. She was the third child right after Jack. And so we are going to dedicate the third episode. And maybe also the fourth? To Rosemary. Rosemary. She was the beauty of the family above all of her siblings. But she ended up the hidden Kennedy. More than the mafia, more than Marilyn, the CIA, Jack's meth habit, Rosemary was the Kennedy family secret. And yet, Rosemary changed the world. They were at the helm during the most turbulent moment in American history. The rumors are legion. Some sincere, some slander. They gave everything to their country. But what did it look like behind closed doors? in their homes, the most intimate moments of their time on Earth. Sometimes the truth is more wild than the headlines. They seemed to live the easy life, but they lost it all in an instant. They ran faster, worked harder, burned brighter, and then they were gone. You have just listened to the Kennedy Siblings, Episode 2, From Blood and Business. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind-the-scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support, and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business. The main two sources for this episode were An Unfinished Life, John Fitzgerald Kennedy by Robert Dalek, and Kick by Paula Byrne. To see a complete list of sources for all Blood and Business episodes, head on over to Patreon for a free PDF download.